I'd invite you to take your Bibles. We're going back to Ezra chapter 9. We're in a series on great prayers of Old Testament saints, and we're looking at a second confession prayer. Last week we looked, or a couple weeks ago, we looked at Daniel's great prayer of confession. And now we want to look at another confession prayer by Ezra. I realize it's politically incorrect to admit or acknowledge when we've sinned. It seems that our national leaders struggle to fess up. And there, there are many in our uh, circle of acquaintance where sin is not recognized. In fact, we've become a culture of blame shifting to a degree that I cannot remember. It's no wonder then that we, that we have so little inner peace and, and so much turmoil. Because there is a reluctance in all of us to face and deal with and recognize sin. C. A. Spurgeon warned his fellow pastors of the danger of dealing with sin and sinners professionally. He said, so that we lose not our dread of evil. What used to shock us has unfortunately become commonplace and routine. The poet Alexander Pope and writer said this, Vice is a monster of so frightful mien as to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too oft familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. Our text relates Ezra's reaction to the sin of the exiles who had returned to Israel after the Babylonian captivity. God in His grace was making it possible through foreign pagan leadership to bring His people back to their land. God had sent them out in discipline because of their sin of idolatry and adultery. And now by grace, God is bringing them back and giving them another opportunity. And Ezra was part of that return. And about four and a half months after he led a remnant of people back to the land, it was reported to him that many of the people, including the leadership, the Levites and the priests and the governmental leaders that were going to have the task of overseeing the reestablishment of the people in the land, Ezra heard that they were sinning by taking pagan wives for their daughters, and many of them as leaders were marrying pagan foreign women. Now, Ezra didn't take this news in stride. He he didn't say, well, people will be people. But you'll discover in the text that he tore his clothes. In the first five verses, you, you see his reaction. He tore his clothes, and, and he tore his beard, and, uh, and he pulled his hair from his head. And the Bible says he sat down appalled and speechless until the time of the evening offering. Well, of course, a lot of people notice that. I mean, if you were to go out in your front yard and do something like this in your neighborhood, I'm sure people would notice and wonder what's going on. By then, a number of godly people had gathered around Ezra, and as Ezra rose, he fell to his knees, and he lifted his hands to the Lord, and he confessed the great sin of his people. He identified himself with the sin of his people, even though he wasn't guilty of this particular sin. And then he, uh, he poured his heart out to the Lord in confession. I think his is one of the great confession prayers of the Bible. I want us to listen to it. We pick up his prayer in verse 6. And we're going to read to the end of his prayer. And it takes us all the way to verse 15. And I want you to listen to his prayer. I want you to, to feel his passion in his prayer. And, and especially do I want you to compare his prayer with the way that most of us pray. Or should I say, the way most of us do not pray. Ezra chapter 9, we pick up in verse 6. And this is what he prays. Oh my God, I'm ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. And our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we've been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to sword, to captivity, to plundering, 
unto utter shame as it is today. But now for a brief moment favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within His holy place, that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery, for we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us His steadfast love before the kings of Persia, to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we've forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants the prophets, saying, the land that you're entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands and with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever." After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this, shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh Lord... The God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. I've read that prayer over. I have to tell you, I was convicted by that prayer. My prayers are so paltry. Somehow, Ezra captures for us the perspective of God when a people sin. Ezra's prayer teaches us how godly people are supposed to react to sin. First of all, I learn in the verses 10 through 14 that we react in a godly manner to sin when we recognize it by the Scripture. Look at verse 10. We have forsaken your commandments. Look at verse 11, which you commanded to your servants, the prophets. Verse 14, shall we break your commandments again? How do we know what's right and wrong? There are a lot of people often ask, how can I tell? Our young people often say, well, how do I know whether something is right or wrong? Now, some believe that you can tell what is right or wrong by the matter of having peace in your heart. I've had young people tell me that they're going to marry non-Christians because they have prayed about it and they feel that God has given them a peace. Never mind that the Bible states very clearly that it is wrong to connect in a permanent way with an unbeliever. There have been people who tell me they know Jesus, yet they feel peace about divorcing their mates for unbiblical reasons. I, I'm afraid the peace they feel is the relief from escaping from some difficult situation and not a peace that comes from the Spirit of God that is indwelling them. Others say that you can, uh, you can know right from wrong by your conscience. Some say we should follow our conscience. Some people say let your conscience be your guide. There's a problem with that because your conscience is only as reliable as to the degree it is shaped by Scripture. My conscience and your conscience is a, is a pliable piece of clay. And when you ply it by certain externals, perhaps from cultural inputs rather than biblical input, 
it can harden in a certain direction. It can, as the Bible says, your conscience can be burned or seared or set in a certain way. So it is not a reliable guide. My conscience needs to be informed by this book. I had a couple some time ago come to me and they want to be married. And of course, my question is, they want to be married in a church. They don't attend here. My first question is, why do you want to be married in a church? Well, we, we want to please God. And I said, well, let me ask you another question. Uh, are you living together? Oh, yes. Then let me tell you, if you really want to please God, how you do that. And often the response I hear is something like this, Pastor, we've prayed about it. Our conscience is clear. We think it's okay to live together before marriage. Now that tells me right away that their conscience is not being informed or molded by this book. It's rather being informed and molded by cultural powers and input. So when I come to Ezra's prayer, I'm listening to him. And I discover that he tells us what the guide is for determining right and wrong. He says it's the Scripture. This is how he determines that his people have sinned and that he has sinned. And he gives us two reasons why the Scripture is the proper guide to determining right and wrong. Number one, he tells us that Scripture reveals to us what sin is. Ezra was appalled when he heard about these Jews marrying pagans because he knew that God's word condemns it. In verse 10 he says, we've forsaken your commands. And he goes on to cite God's prohibition and he summarizes Exodus chapter 34 verses 11 through 16 and Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 1 through 4 where God clearly stated that he does not want his people intermarrying with pagan foreigners. So when the princes reported that the Holy seed had been intermingled with the peoples of the land, please remember their concern was not racial corruption, but moral and spiritual corruption. Because they understood God's original command, and God explained His reason for this command in Deuteronomy chapter 7. He says, if you, if you disobey this command, you will, they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And we have prime examples of that. All you have to do is go back and look at King Solomon. King Solomon had many, many wives and and the Bible clearly states he loved them, and they turned his heart away from following God. So the Word of God knows what it's talking about. It is not just the preacher's whim or the church's prerogative to tell you young people not to date and eventually intermarry with someone who is an unbeliever. They could be the nicest people in all the world, and yet God understands how quickly your heart can be turned from God. You see, what we often think is that, well, what I'll do is I'll date them and, and I'll witness to them, and when we get married, they'll get saved. I've been at this 50 years in ministry. You know what I found out? I found out 98% of the time it goes the other way. You don't influence them. They influence you. See, that's why God gave this command, and, and that's why Ezra is so upset. That's why he rips his clothes and tears his hair and his beard out, because he understands the long-term consequences of what can happen to the people of God if they begin to engage in this kind of practice. That's why he called holy seed calls Israel a holy seed, not because they were better than other nations, but because God has set them apart as His people. When you come to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says you are sanctified, you are set apart, you are devoted to God and His will. And to refuse to follow the will of God is to commit spiritual adultery. And when I, and when I read this, I think of Malachi's day, 
where the Jewish married men were divorcing their Jewish wives in order to marry pagan women. You know what Malachi has said? He denounced them for this, and he reminded them that God was seeking a godly, a holy seed. I mean, after all, the Messiah is going to come from their people. Now, let's make something clear. I want to be very clear about this. The Old Testament did not completely forbid intermarriage with foreigners. And we know that because you, you have several great men of faith who married non-Israelite wives. You have Boaz who married Ruth, was, who was a Moabitess. You, you have Moses who, who married a Midianite woman. You have Joseph in Genesis marrying an Egyptian woman. But here's the thing. If you examine the text carefully, ultimately these women were not pagan in their religion. It's very evident when you read the book of Ruth that Ruth converted, became a believer in the God in Yahweh of Israel. But what God's concern was for His people, if they begin to practice this as a nation... And, were not, and, and ceased to be discerning about spiritual things, they would intermarry with those who refused to give up their paganism. Ahab found this to be true. Of course, he was an irreligious guy from the beginning, but he married Jezebel, and Jezebel brought all her gods, and he built a temple to her gods. And you know the result of Baal worship and what happened in Israel as a result. This is the very reason that Samson's parents were upset with him because he wanted a pagan foreigner for a wife. They weren't prejudicial because of her racial background. They were prejudicial because of her spiritual background. God's warning of this practice was spot on because what happens sometimes is what we call syncretism. Syncretism is a, is a simple way of saying and it's been a problem where we, we add to our faith beliefs and patterns of behavior that are practices of those who are not godly, who are not spiritual, who haven't been born again, who haven't seen and experienced the changes the Spirit of God brings when Christ comes to live in the life. And as a result of that, there becomes a moment in time where that individual who has practiced syncretism becomes indistinguishable from people who really know Jesus. And then the question comes, well, I thought he was a Christian. Well, you know, he, he went to youth group, and this happens, uh, Pastor Jeff and I have talked about this, this happens so often. A child will come up through youth group, and they'll, and they'll get out and go into the college world, and it's like they forget everything this book says. As if, well, I, that doesn't apply to me anymore. God wants me to be happy. Really, where do you get that from the Word of God? All I read is God wants you to be holy, and happiness is a byproduct. Real joy is a byproduct of the happiness that comes from holiness, not the other way around. Nowhere does God advise you, admonish you, push you in the direction of seeking your own happiness. If I understand the Bible correctly, God's desire is for you to pour out your life on the behalf of others. And joy comes as a result of that not something we manufacture. God said, look, I know what I'm talking about. The way we think, the way we live must be shaped by the Scripture, not by the world. James says in James 4, For you know adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. John put it as bluntly in 1 John 2.15, Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Those are hard words. Those are difficult words for us. God isn't saying we're not friendly to people that don't know Jesus. God isn't saying that we cease to associate with them. Of course not. Our mission is to, is to reach them with the good news of Jesus Christ. What God is concerned about is that we embrace their lifestyle and their way of thinking and their cultural mindset and abandon what we know to be true from the Word of God. Satan loves to use the tool of an unbelieving person 
to ensnare many. No wonder Paul says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. So the first reason I learned from Ezra's prayer that the Scripture is the guide to teach me right and wrong is the Scripture reveals what sin is. Number two, I learned a second thing about Scripture being the right guide from his prayer, and that is this. Scripture reveals to us what sin does to people. This is why that we can confidently take this book and I can predict this is where you're going to end up if you stay on this particular path. One of the most frustrating things as a pastor is to have people come in for counsel who are in trouble with their lives and to give them an answer from the Word of God and they'll say, well, all that's well and good, but I'm not going to do that because I don't believe that. And then a couple years later, do you know what happens? What happens, or maybe sometimes it doesn't take that long, the very things the Bible predict, predicts takes place. And then you make a call and you help them pick up the pieces because they wouldn't listen to the voice of God. And so Ezra teaches us, and, and he tells us in verse 7, he reveals where the nation's sins had led them. In verse 7 he says, On account of our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to plunder, and to open shame. Four times he refers to his people as an escaped remnant. In verse 9, verse 13, verse 14, and verse 15. And he's showing us how strong this nation had been and how decimated they were by their sin. And he repeatedly uses words like slaves and bondage and ruins to describe the people. And he acknowledges if they don't repent, God would be very just and right and, and absolutely honest if he allowed all their sins to catch up with them with its consequences. The Bible warns us that sin enslaves us, that sin destroys us. Marvin Brenneman, in his New American Commentary on Ezra, said this, Christians who adopt a lifestyle that negates Jesus' commands are sacrificing both the future of the church and that of the peoples it should be reaching with the gospel. Pastor Scott Cole who pastored for years in Arizona, said this, If we blend into the world, lost peoples will not hear the gospel through our witness and our support of missionaries. Our children will grow up thinking that Christianity has nothing to do with how we live, and they will reject the faith altogether. That's, that's why we must know God's Word so that we can instantly recognize sin in ourselves and in our family, and, and realize the dire consequences if we continue in that direction. Some of you don't like the admonitions your parents have given you. You think they don't know the, the left hand from the right. They don't understand you. But I'll tell you what, if they're, what they're telling you is in line with this, you better listen to them. Because God's Word comes to pass, whether, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, God's Word comes to pass. You know the verse, Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. Proverbs says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, there's a second lesson I learned from Ezra's prayer, and I want you to learn with me, and that is how we react. We react in a godly manner to sin, not only when we see it through the pages of Scripture, but when we mourn over it. And you'll notice in verse 3, Ezra's response, I tore my garment and my cloak, pulled my hair, set appalled. Verse 5, verse 4, I set appalled. Verse 5, fasting and fell on my knees and spread my hands. And in verse, chapter 10 and verse 1, Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. See, how a person reacts to the news of sin tells you a lot about that person, doesn't it? I mean, if you hear about a case of adultery in a friend of yours, and you get a subtle thrill listening to the juicy details of it, I can tell you that it reveals that you do not hate sin. The godly reaction to sin is to, is to mourn over it. If you're always trying to excuse your sin, and when somebody calls you on the carpet for something you've done that in your heart you know is not right, and yet you persist in that direction, and you do not mourn over it, 
then you are demonstrating that your heart is not in line with God and His Word. Ezra takes it seriously. I was curious about the word appalled. We use it in our language, do we not? You see something that's absolutely way out there, and you said, I was appalled at this response, or I was appalled that this happened. Interestingly enough, the Hebrew word appalled means to cause horror. It's the idea of being awestruck and astounded. It comes from a root word which means to be absolutely stunned to the point where you can't even talk about it. You're so, you're so overwhelmed by what was done or what was said. Well, that's the word that the Spirit of God chose to use to describe Ezra's response. Now, I realize his reaction probably seems extreme to us, doesn't it? I mean, when's the last time when you heard about sin, you ripped your clothes and tore your hair, and if you have a beard, you started to pull your beard out, and you fell down before your face? You said, well, that's a cultural thing back then. I think what it does show, however, is the state of the heart when it comes to a reaction to sin. We don't have that kind of reaction. We, we go, oh, that's too bad, isn't it? Mm, that's awful. Edwin Yakamochi said, Rare is the soul who is so shocked at disobedience that he is appalled. R.W. Dale, the old preacher of years ago, said, It is partly because sin does not provoke our own wrath that we do not believe that sin provokes the wrath of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my favorite writers and preachers, said this in his Sermon on the Mount text. He said, I cannot help feeling that the final explanation of the state of the church today is a defective sense of sin and a defective doctrine of sin. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I think Spurgeon was right when he said that people often join the prodigal son in saying, Father, I have sinned. That's why they don't get to have a joyful banquet afterwards. How, how can somebody be healed who isn't sick? How can somebody be satisfied with bread who isn't hungry or don't sense that they are hungry? When God changes our hearts through the new birth, He gives us new hungers. He gives us new desires. He gives us a new sense of our understanding of sin and what it's done. And when I... And I see Ezra steeped in the word of God that he knew that God's severe discipline would fall again on the people and the implications of their sin. He, he literally fell apart. He was appalled. He ripped his clothes in agony over it. I mean, what would you think if you went to the doctor and he diagnosed you with cancer and he said something like this, uh, now I feel for you. Go home, take a couple aspirin, you'll be okay. Would you go back to a doctor like that? I would hope not. Or how about this? Suppose a fireman responds to a report of your house on fire. When he gets there, he says to you, it'll burn itself out soon enough. You just stand here. It'll, it'll burn itself out. Or how about a policeman who arrives at the scene of your house where two men have broken in and they apprehend that, and he turns to them and he says, well, we're going to let them go. Boys will be boys. See, those, those reactions and that response is inappropriate to the situation. May I suggest to you that our reaction normally to sin is not appropriate either? A godly person's response to sin, whether it's his own sin or the sin of others, should be mourned. The attitude should come that I tremble at God's Word. So here's what Ezra's prayer has taught us so far. He's taught us that the, the proper way godly people react to sin is to measure that sin by the Word of God, to see it in light of the Word of God, that God's Word is our only guide for right and wrong because it reveals the sin and it reveals what happens to people who sin. Secondly, we learn that godly people respond to sin as they should by mourning over it, not by joking about it, not by by seeing the funny side of it, not by taking it seriously, but absolutely mourning over it, whether it's my sin or the sin of my child or the, 
sin of, of somebody at church or the sin of our nation, we, we mourn over that because that's God's response. And then there's one other lesson. This is an incredible lesson. And that is this. We react in a godly manner to sin when we confess it without excuse. And that's what Ezra does. Ezra's prayer of confession reminds me so much of Daniel's prayer of confession. Even though Ezra himself had not committed this particular sin, he, like Daniel, identified himself with the sin of these people. I'm telling you, it would have been so easy for Ezra to have said, Lord, these people of yours are obstinate and wicked, and you are righteous to judge them, but I'm not like them. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that at all. He, he starts using terms like we and are, just like Daniel did. And he made no excuses for his sin or the sin of his people. Several years ago, the story was reported where an editor wrote a series of articles about all the things that were wrong in the world. And at the end of each article, he asked this question, what's wrong with the world? What's wrong with the world? And the editor received a letter back from the famous G.K. Chesterton, who was a writer and a philosopher, very well known. And G.K. Chesterton gave him this answer. This is what was in his letter, and you can read it there. This is what he said. Dear editor, what's wrong with the world? I am faithfully yours, G.K. Chesterton. What was he saying? He wasn't excusing sin. I'm the problem. You're the problem. Our hearts are the problem. That's why we have sin. And the godly reaction to sin is to confess it without excuse to the God of mercy. Now here's something that's really amazing to me, and I'm not going to go over it again because we went over it last week, but think about this. You remember the three things that we saw in Daniel's prayer that are always true of a prayer of confession of sin. Anywhere you go in the Bible and you see confession of sin, you see it in David's confession, you, you see it in Daniel's confession, now we're seeing it again in Ezra's confession. These three elements are always there. First of all, there's a true acknowledgement of sin. And that's, and that's what you see here. Uh, Ezra is, is confessing. He, he says, we're shamed. We, we've, we've forsaken God's commandments. We've done evil deeds. We have great guilt. And the second element is that he admits that sin always brings judgment. He doesn't excuse it. He, he just does exactly what Daniel does. He, he talks about the judgment that comes. God, you're righteous to bring this to us. We deserve this. This, this is what happens when we go against God. He does exactly what Daniel did. And then number three, the third element is there too, in which he pleads for God's mercy in verse 8 and 9 and verse 15. He throws himself and his people on the mercy of God. I want you to notice that Ezra's prayer makes no specific petition, but rather just casts himself on God's undeserved mercy. Verse 15, that's what he does. That's how he ends the prayer. He just throws himself on the mercy of God and his people. That's what Daniel did. By the way, there's something really interesting. Did you notice that Ezra really was praying about the time of the evening sacrifice when his prayer came to a close? I don't know, I can't prove this, but I wonder if the smell of the evening sacrifice and the very fact going on moved his heart to realize how serious this was. Because these sacrifices were being made regularly, supposedly for the people to confess their sins and that, and that God would take a substitute in their place which mirrors and pictures what Jesus did for us when He came and died on the cross and took my place and he, and he took your place and He bore my sin and He bore your sin so that when I repent of my sins and put my trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior and by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone I realize, hey, only Christ can get me out of this. It's then that I have the perspective God wants me to have of sin. I'm helpless in it. I'm a slave in it. Sin is, is bondage. And only Christ can set us free. Well, what do we do with all this? I like something J.C. Ryle. I've read some of his books. He lived in the mid-1800s, was a very godly pastor said this, Christ is never fully valued until sin is clearly seen. Unless I own up to my sin and clearly see it for what it is, 
I will never, ever value Christ. Let me tell you something. Don't ever come to me and say, say to me you love Jesus if you're tolerating unconfessed sin in your life. Those two things just do not go together. Because when you love Christ, Jesus himself says, when you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. And one of the things that God tells us to do is to confess and forsake our sin. So don't fool yourself into thinking, I love Jesus if you're holding on to your sin and not letting it go. Now, you may love a lot of things. You may like to hear Christian music. You may like to read Christian books. It may give you a real, real gushy feeling. You think about Jesus in heaven, but I'll tell you something. Don't ever say you love him until you and I have dealt with our sin. So what do I do? So I want, I want you to ask yourself these three questions. Is my first reaction to sin one that sees it clearly from the Scriptures? Is that how I'm looking at sin? Am I, am I looking through the lens of this culture where people around me say, hey, it's okay to live with somebody before you're married. Hey, it's okay to cuss. Hey, it's okay to cheat. Hey, it's okay to take money. If you can get it, get it any way you can. You've got to survive. If you're looking at your life through that lens then you'll never be able to tell what's right and wrong. In fact, I will make a prediction, you will always tend to do what's wrong. You see, that's why the Word of God has to be our guide. Not peace, not conscience, this book. Secondly, second question, do we realize that sin put our Savior on the cross and does that cause us to mourn over it? Something that killed Jesus ought not have a comfortable place in my life, don't you think? Don't you think the very thing that nailed Jesus to the cross ought to be something you and I hate enough to deal with, hate enough to put aside? What's wrong with us? If you can look at Jesus in the Scriptures as He dies on the cross and walk away from that and continue in your sin, I ask you, what kind of person are you? And the third question do we specifically confess sin without excusing it to God? Do I confess it? But in my heart of hearts, I really don't think it's that bad. I, I just want out from under the pressure. I don't want to feel guilty, so I'll confess it. Okay. But in reality, I have no plans of leaving that action, that behavior behind. I have no idea of changing my way of thinking and making changes in my behavior and my actions and my habits and my relationships. Because you see, true confession of sin means I'm going to let go of what I've been holding on to. I'm going to let it go. Confession, the word confession means to agree with God that God was right about this. So you can ask God to forgive you, but if you're not willing to let it go, that's not biblical confession. That's why Ezra was so upset with the people. And when you read what happens, go on and read in chapter 10 what happens. It'll thrill your heart, the revival that broke out in Israel over this. In fact, what's absolutely amazing to me is, is these men who had taken foreign wives, took them back home and dissolved the relationship. Wow. That's confession. C.S. Lewis observed this, and I close with this. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less endless. He put it right, didn't he? For the wages of sin is death. Ezra saw the writing on the wall for his people, and he was appalled. I want us to be appalled so that the next part of that text becomes real. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You don't have to live in the pool of sin. God wants to take you out. Through the power of grace, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me for a moment? And let me ask you as we close, where are you in relation to sin? You say, Pastor, this is, this is such a, 
a negative, heavy message. I want to come and hear something light and airy. You know, I'll tell you something. You can't get to the joy until you deal with the pain that sin has created. It's God's desire to show grace and mercy to you. God demonstrated His love to you while you and I were still in our sins. He sent Christ to die for us. Don't ever doubt that God absolutely, categorically, unequivocally loves you. He loves you with a love that cannot be put into human language. It's a sacrificial kind of love that we don't understand. It's an eternal love that many times we test that love. and God comes back and still loves us. But that doesn't mean there are not consequences to our sin. And that doesn't mean that someday God will not say to you, depart from me, I never knew you, if you don't come to Jesus. So as we close, ask yourself, am I, am I understanding and dealing with sin as the Bible tells me to? Am I mourning over it? Am I making excuses for it? You know, right now where you are, you can say, Lord Jesus, I've been running from you too long. I've been, I've been running and running and running, and these things in my life you keep speaking to me about, and I keep saying no and no and no. And I've become, you've become headstrong and stubborn in your sin. And you know, what, you know what worries me so much? You know what makes me grieve and mourn? is because I know where your path is going to go. He said, Pastor, how can you know that? Because God's already told us. He's already said where that path goes. And I don't want you to go there. In fact, today, I wonder if you'll humble your heart and you'll ask the Lord to forgive you. I mean really confess your sins, and that means you're going to let go of those things that put Jesus on the cross. You're going to come and let Jesus cleanse your sin away. Oh, such a good news when John said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I hope you want that. And if you've never come to Jesus and repented of your sins and put your trust in Him, He's the only one that can set you free from what sin has done in all of our lives. He restores a right purpose for life. He gives you assurance of tomorrow. But even more than that, He comes to live with you and be with you, to strengthen you and help you in this dark and crazy world we live in. We're going to sing a song in a moment. And after we sing the song and we take a phase two offering and we close in prayer. We're going to have counselors up by the piano over here. And they're here to pray with you. They're here to, to talk to you about your need of Christ. They're here to pray with you if, if God has convicted you of sin and you, you're miserable in it. You, you don't want to continue, but you need somebody to pray with you. They're here. I want you to come. Lord Jesus, we come to you confessing that our attitude to sin has been so callous and light. I'm not just speaking of others, I'm speaking of myself. You're teaching me. You're teaching me how important it is to look at sin like you do. Forgive me for the times I've been too lighthearted about it. That I've been able to sin and even horror of horrors excuse it. And read of Jesus dying on the cross for that very thing. I'm ashamed. Embarrassed. As I pray to you. Please help me, Lord, not to repeat this pattern. I need your help. I want to be able to say I love you. May we as a church be able to say we love you. And we ask it in Jesus' name.